No, we'll take it Okay, there you go. Thank you. Tēnā katoa, welcome to this meeting of the Central Otago District Council. Great to see so many people here and to see democracy in action. Thank you so much for coming. For those who are unfamiliar with this place, I'll just guide through what we'll be doing. We'll start very shortly with Karakia, which will be done by Councillor Tana Ali. We'll then be standing for a moment of silence to remember some lost former members of Council. Then we'll come to Public Forum, which will be in the order they came in to us in Mary, Dr Neil and Professor Peter. Um, they will each have five minutes to speak, uh, followed by questions from councillors. Each, each person will be followed by questions um, rather than all together at the end. Um, so we will have a cut ahead, please. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa po nāru te moana. Hei hoa rahi mā tato e tēnei rā, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato kia tato katoa. Homie, hui e. Thank you. I'd ask now members and members of the public to stand in memory of two uh, former well, councillors and beyond, former Deputy Mayor of CODC, Cliff Brunton, and former Mayor of CODC, Dr Malcolm McPherson. Thank you very much. I'll be talking about those gentlemen further during my mayoral report. <laughs> So it's my pleasure now to welcome Mary Brown to join us. Right, um, thank you for having me. Um, right, so I've got a five minute presentation, so I'll hopefully I'll only take five minutes and we'll make them a little less. So we're going to be talking about ruination, the process from the director from the um, Director General of Health to a number of councils around the country. There's new legislation. That will push fluoridation into leave councils that provide 500 people in the world. So, um, we just wanted to convey that fluoridation was a bad idea and that we would like councils to push back the facts and comment them. The key fact swallowing the fluoride is not an effective way to reduce tooth decay. We can provide a whole lot of information on that. Fluoride compounds added to the water supplies are literally toxic waste. Is unbelievable as that sounds. The US National Toxicology Program has found that exposure to fluoride in the water and in the light causes brain damage similar to that caused by the lead. So, thank you, Drop. Um, New Zealand proponents of fluoridation now say that fluoride benefit is topical rather than systemic. So, originally, um, the theory that fluoridation was based on was that your children had fluoride while their teeth were growing and got into the enamel and made them more resistant to dental decay. So, that theory actually got debunked in 1999 by the Centers for Disease Control, and in New Zealand they now mostly want to admit that. So this is Robin Hayes from Welsh, who was a former oral health advisor, and she says the literature of health no longer promote fluoride tablets. So that's not an alternative to fluoridation. They don't, they don't, give, they don't promote the tablets. And if you do go buy the tablets, it says don't give to pregnant women or children over three. This is from the New Zealand School of Dental Statistics, this one, and um, what happens is these statistics are given to the Ministry of Health every year, so you can go to their website and find this data, and the red line shows the number of um, the case of single fill team, the average number of fillings that children are having in the fluoridated area, and the blue line is the non-fluoridated area, and what we can see is basically it's the same. So, because they have it for every DHB and it's cut into fluoridated and non fluoridated areas, if you go and look at the spreadsheets. So, what that's showing us is that there's basically no difference. And, you know, if anything, the non fluoridated for five year olds is doing a little bit better. This, is, this one here is the number of uh, five year olds with no dental decay at all. So, you can see that the percentages on the left hand side there you know, 40 to 60 percent. So it's around 60 percent, but it's exactly the same. Fluoridated, non-fluoridated areas. And probably that's because fluoride doesn't work by swallowing. Um, we actually promote um, an alternative to fluoridation, which is called Child Smile. And it's, it's, about, it's based on school toothbrushes. This is what they do in non-fluoridated Scotland. So most of the world is not fluoridated, particularly the Western world. 
it's not fluoridated. So they do the school toothbrushing, and what they what they found was that um, it had it's had a huge impact on dental health, and it's half the number of general anaesthetics that children need. So that's a big significant change for those children for starters, and then also for um, society because it saves an awful lot of time. They don't have to have general anaesthetics because that's when the children have really bad tooth decay. So this here, um, this is a thing we put on TV a few years ago. Not long, maybe, and it doesn't work. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, no. it's just that technology, not yours. Uh, it sounds like mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's kind of important. It's good to see the advert because what we're um, saying is that. Fluoride is produced as a byproduct of phosphate fertilizer manufacture, and it produces two gases that go into the chimneys. That's plain, it's just not the same. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's probably it's probably something else that is a sound. Mm -hmm. Um no, I just want to come in here for five minutes. So I'll put it back to the beginning. Yeah. Because we put it here at the time, so I'm going to get it here. Fluoride is a waste product collected from the chimneys of the fertilizer industry. This fluoride chemical also contains traces of lead, aluminum, mercury, arsenic, and sometimes uranium. It is banned from being released into the air, sea, lakes, and rivers because it is toxic to animals and the environment. Instead, ratepayers money buys this toxic chemical handled by workers wearing hazmat suits like this. This fluoride is what goes into our drinking water. Find out the facts. Is it fluoridefree.org.nz? So uh, when we put the stand out, we got complaints from the public that went to the Advertising Standards Authority. So we um, provided the evidence to the ASA and none of the complaints were upheld. So you can find our response on our website under New Zealand specific information, um, Advertising Standards Complaints. So this is this is literally what happens. They can't dump that into, they're not allowed to get it into the air, they can't go and dump it into a lake or a sea or a river, so, but they can put it into tankers, drive it to the council and drip feed it through the public water supply. And then ultimately, of course, it goes out to these beautiful lakes. Um, so, fluoride has also been linked to lots of other problems. These are the main ones, just thyroid, increased risk of back to the elderly, increased cancer. But what um, what we're mostly focused on at the moment is the neurotoxicity because that's where the best science is available for that. So the National Toxicology Program in the US, who are like the top, the top science body here when um, convened to look into an issue, they have looked at 55 studies, 52 show a lowering of IQ. So that's a 95% consistency with an average of seven IQ point drop. And that's um, similar to what was happening with lead when it was in Cape and Petra. Now, what happens if there's a five IQ point drop across this, uh, society is that it shifts the whole IQ curve to the left and you half the number of geniuses and increase by 50% the number of intellectually impaired. So if Fluoridation is forced upon this council, that, that is what will happen here. It will reduce the IQ, probably of everybody, but um, and, but definitely have this effect on the people at the lower end who will be shifted from being able to function to not able to function. So it's obviously very serious. And um, just um, this is the last five minutes, but I've got a question for you. I, what by what means could a council push back to the laws for or the law that has been passed? Yeah, so what's happened is New Health New Zealand, another organisation, have taken a judicial review 
against the Director General of Health. So what it means is that in every council that gets that directive could seek an interim injunction and that only costs about a thousand dollars. And all that would do is go to the courts and say, we don't want to put fluoridation in until we know the outcome of that New Health New Zealand court case. Do you so, have a, <laughs> an idea of how long it would be for that to go through that court case? Yeah, well, first, the meeting, uh, there's a hearing this coming up September, and that's just going to look at whether or not the Director General um, properly considered the Bill of Rights. Then there'll be a warning on that, and it could be that. The, the judge says, no, they didn't, and the DG has to go back and do some work. And then New Health New Zealand have to do another case, but they will do another case. They, they will sort of go up again. And then it could take a few years because it's been pushed out by appeals and going to Supreme Court, etc. And in the meantime, what we're hoping is the information on neurotoxicity will reach the right people who start making the right decision. Plus, there's a court case going on in the USA that might find that, um, you know, it should be illegal. So it's a simple thing, actually, for the council to do. Thank you. Um, Neil, could you take over? I'll come back to Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mary. Any other questions from the councillors? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Ah, so uh, Neil, while well, speaking on floor as well, welcome Neil, you um, Billy Technologies, uh, and yeah. let's talk about. Apologies from you, just um, being called away on another matter to do with this. Um, rewards. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Neil Waddell. I'm a retired professor of clinical materials from the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Chicago. I retired in December 2021. As a research scientist, I have 123 peer reviewed scientific uh, journal articles, and I was eight years on the Dental Council when the Health Practitioners Copy Assurance Act was brought into being. I was one of the early ones who implemented that. And the Health Amendment Act to 2021, fluoridation of drinking water is coming to came into effect in December 2021. This allows the Director General of Health to direct authorities to fluoridate the drinking water. So sometime in the future, uh, you are going to be receiving a letter to direct you to fluoridate the local water supplies. This is a form of medical and dental treatment that is then forced upon the population. Now we have a thing called informed consent, and this came out of the Nuremberg Code, which was the Nuremberg Trials after the Second World War. And it's part of our New Zealand, it's, it's, it's embedded in our New Zealand Bill of Rights, 1990. And Section 11 says the right to refuse to undergo any medical treatment, except in the case of involuntary commitment. And it's embodied in most Bill of Rights around the world and the United Nations as well. It's also, um, embedded in the Health and Disability Commissioner's Code of Health and Disability Consumer Rights, and every single health regulatory authority has to have this embedded in their practice standards. Everybody in the health domain knows about it. And this is just a little big fact of it. It states you to receive an explanation of potential risks and side effects, benefits, and cost of each option. On this basis, the patient can make an informed choice whether or not to give their consent to treatment. So I'm now going to just explain the chemistry side of what happens when you fluoridate your water. <laughs> First of all, fluorine is a highly toxic element and it is extremely reactive. If you were to breathe the fluorine gas, you would drop dead. And hydrofluoric acid is one of the most nasty acids that we have, uh, that we deal with. And that's when you combine hydrogen with fluorine and water. H2O is where the hydrogen comes from. Again, highly toxic extremely powerful contact poison and one of its things can penetrate tissue and it necrotizes and if you're exposed to this the skin eyes inhale or swallow it is bad news the little bottle on the left you see on the screen is plastic so reactive you can't keep it in a glass container it attacks the silica and dissolves it and you can't keep it in metal containers because it's so corrosive it would corrode it you have to put it in all the fittings have got to be plastic 
and all the tanks are going to be double lined plastic, and the tank that brings it is double lined plastic. Fluoride is simply a compound that contains fluorine, and fluorine is being so reactive that binds with every other element. So just as we say there's an oxide, fluoride means it's bound to another element. So it's not at one specific fluoride. Fluoride can be any element where fluorine is bound. We simply say it's ammonium fluoride, it's potassium fluoride. You simply put the first element name first with fluoride behind it, and that's how reactive it is. From a biological context, it's highly insoluble. It creates these insoluble salts. And this is a key thing to understand. It binds to the elements in your body like calcium and magnesium, and it disrupts these. So the calcium system is most important in your body. It is the mechanism by which all the nerve endings send their messages, and it's stored in your bones. When you drink a glass of fluoride, immediately that fluorine component binds with that calcium and removes it from being available to your body system. The same with magnesium. It's a cofactor in over 300 enzyme systems plus the synthesis of DNA and RNA. So you're reducing each time you drink your glass of fluoride or fluoridated water by that amount that the fluorine will look to bind to the body and it takes it out of being available to the rest of the body system. So the form in which we get it is from, as I say, byproduct of the fertilizer industry and it produces hydrofluorosilicetic acid as a liquid. And this is what arrives to your water treatment plant. They then take a concentrated hydrofluorosilicetic acid and they dilute it into your water system. So now when you turn the tap on, you're not getting water, you're getting very dilute hydrofluorosilicetic acid. They simply take the strong acid diluted into your water through the dosage process. When this combines with the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, this produces hydrofluoric acid, which is that nasty acid I talked about in the previous slide. And this is very reactive. One of the things is it is poisonous to your microbiome in your gastrointestinal tract, as well as to bind with those other salts in your system. Neil, um, unfortunately, that's the five minutes. Yep. Is there, I've got a question for you. Is there a final quick summation or four point you want to make? The summation is that it's not about teeth. The danger of fluoride is what it does when it binds to the various elements in your body system and removes it from being available. Once it's found equilibrium, then it stops. But you have another glass and away it goes again. And the smaller the person is, especially in the womb, the most vulnerable because you can't control dosage. Once it's in the water, if you take the baby's bottle and you mix the formula, you're actually going to get a nine point drop in IQ. And this is actually proved by the science that Mary referred to. Okay. So the extreme danger of this is what it does to body systems. Right, not the teeth. And that's, that's the, the main take home here. Thank you. The question I have for you, is there a filter that people can put on their drinking water taps that will remove fluorine, fluoride, whatever it is? No, there's not. You've got to go to reverse osmosis or distill right. types of the system. Thank you. Because it's so, well, such a strong binder, it doesn't come out. No. Councillors, questions? No, thank you very much. Very informative. Yeah. Now let's make one final statement. If the council would like a full presentation on the real detail on this, I live uh, just south of Balcutha and will be available to come and give you more detail. But I would encourage you all to educate yourself around this issue because although it may be legal, you've got to do it morally, is about the story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Up to Neil. And then the next speaker is um, Professor Peter Herbison. Peter, welcome. Thank you for letting me talk to you. I should say that I'm an emeritus professor of biostatistics. I've worked in public health and clinical health areas for 40 years. Uh, I was in charge of the dental data from the Dunedin study for a while and had uh, published several articles many, many years ago now on fluoridation. Uh, and uh, I'm part of the Cochrane collaboration 
which is a group that produces systematic reviews. So it looks at all the evidence uh, and um, summarizes all the evidence that you get. Uh, now, I should say, apologize first uh, for taking up the time. Uh, and this is a topic of fluoride, uh, in spite of what previous people have said, happens of no business of yours anymore. Uh, it has been removed from purview. Uh, I should say that there have been, throughout the world, there have been many, many groups of experts who have looked at fluoridation. Uh, and I don't want to counter any of the arguments that have been around uh, by one by one, uh, but all of these groups have unanimously agreed that fluoridation at the dose, recommended dose, uh, is not harmful to people and is not, is beneficial for teeth, something like a 23% reduction in decay. Uh, it's important at all stages in life, people who get very elderly have trouble with their teeth, uh, but the, and people who are young have trouble as well. So it's important for all ages. Uh, and the important thing to remember is that the important thing to think about is dose. So they're talking about 0.7 to 1 parts per million. Uh, there is no question that if you have uh, fluoride or whatever, then it, it, in a huge dose, that it isn't good for you. Uh, but these bound compounds, uh, table salt is sodium chloride. Both of those elements are really bad for you individually. Put them together, they're okay. Uh, but to get back to the dose, um, dose is really important. Uh, you know from, as I know from all the pills that I had to take this morning, uh, all of those are harmful to you if you take too much evidence. Uh, and the best example of that is vitamin A. Vitamin A is essential to life, but if you have too much of it, it will kill you, which is why you never eat polar bear livers. Good to know. So I'm saying the vast majority of the opinion is that fluoride is safe and beneficial. All right, thank you very much. Questions for Peter? Well, I want to thank everybody for coming today. We're in a situation at CODC where the uh, Ministry of Health mandate put 14 <laughs> councils on a list that have to get on with it. We're one of them. Uh, 21, I think, uh, that have been told to get prepared. We're not on that list. So um, we can sit and watch the injunctions with interest, but uh, realistically, with $200,000 fines per day for non compliance. I'm glad I'm not on the first list or the second list at this stage, and we'll see where it goes from there. I really want to thank the people who have come and supported speakers for sitting respectfully. That hasn't always happened in other councils, so I want to say I spoke down south a good folks. So thank you all very much for your time. To the speakers, thank you very much for coming. It's been carefully appreciated. Namina. I just want to get a bit more personal. Thank you. 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 Yeah. All right, folks, so we'll move on to the confirmations of the minutes of our last meeting, which was the 19th of July. Um, I'm presuming that nobody has a problem with them because nothing's been raised. So if somebody who was here would like to move those, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Said with Sally. All those in favour, aye, against carried. Um, I do note we've got no apologies today, which is quite remarkable given the amount of illness in place. And um, declarations of interest on page 14, of course, always reminding councillors to make sure that they regularly review those and update them as necessary and give good thought to um, everything taken before us today and whether they have. Uh, got an interest in it, which will take us over to now the three water section. 
Councilor McKinley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ann. Um, we settled with item 23.8.2, the appointment of engineer contract for services operations and making, making this contract. Yeah, not that. Okay, so that. this is um, really a procedural issue. Um, when the uh, three waters manager resigned, um, I've been more involved in the day-to-day -day operational management um, of the three waters, which means that um, I cannot have that impartial role that the engineer of contract needs to have. So in order to be able to manage the risk of um, a bet um, we're recommending that we appoint an independent person as engineer of contract. There's some other unusual people councils to do this. Um, and it's considered best practice in some cases we 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 don't get someone who's impartial but someone else for the council. So that um, recommendation I've made is that we appoint Neil Johnson to the road. Neil's um, really experienced at this. He's be based. Um, he's worked within the council. Um, he can be able to fill the role he has the capacity. So, any issues? Uh, questions around. Yeah. Um, two questions just around the appointment. Would that be automatically terminated at the end of the three water operation and maintenance contract 2022? Yeah, um, yeah, because you an engineer contract is appointed to be a the contract. Yeah. yeah, so whatever you do with contract means that that ends and you would have to reconsider whether that was something you needed to do on any future contracts. And then the other question I had. Sorry, no. Okay. Um, if Neil was being appointed as an independent person to oversee the contract, will Fulton Hogan be contributing to the cost of this appointment? Yeah, so he won't um, oversee the contract. What he'll do is uh, there's um, the big parts that he will, you know, there'll be some level of involvement. It's more around if we, have, we don't agree on variation of the cost or something like that that he would be bought in. Um, we have limited means to be able to. Um, get that cost gap in the contract. I guess if, if the three waters manager is still working here, then I wouldn't be doing that role. So I could be still be independent. So in some regards, it's because I'm now fulfilling another role within council at the moment that we're here for some money. So mm. does that answer the question? The short answer is no, I don't think we can get them to contribute. Well, I would have thought that the normal okay. contractual practice is that we have an engineering contract. That's whoever has the contract, that's the cost of them yeah. to do it, to provide it. So I'd be very, very surprised if, if, if what, well, unless you have in the contract that some of those costs were shared, then that's the cost of the person who's the principal of the contract, would be a matter of course. And and there is a there is a clause in the contract that does enable us to recover costs for some things. We if we've had to do more work because of something happening, but um that that doesn't apply to the engineer. Thank you. Sorry. So we Yeah, just in relation to just probably following on from Tana, how is that? How does all this fit um, budgetary wise? In? Yeah, so we can um, accommodate this within our, um, our professional services budget for the year. Um, it's, we, we have some reduced costs around staffing um, because we don't have the staffing. So that's the kind of balance there. This is like bring, almost bringing in some back to our yeah. role. Are we contracting Neil or are we contracting Rationale? Because I see that that's most of these and works or is contracting to Rationale. So it's an, yeah. is it an individual? We contract Neil, who is works as a consultant for Rationale. So we pay Rationale, but it's the individual that's the person who's appointed to each year the contract. So if, for example, Neil was away, that wouldn't be another person on Rationale. That was my next question. Thank you. Okay, any further questions related to the appointment? I think with explanation, the finger eyes and it's clear um, about the appointment. Um, and well, we, we cover the cost of the consultant, but being independent, that consultant has the ability to look at costs. 
um, from the contractor as well uh, can mediate independently. So we have two recommendations, A and B. A seems important, certain level of significance, and B appoints Neil Jorgensen as engineer to contract for the Spring Waters Operations and Maintenance Contract 2022. Why? Happy to move. Second. Favour? Any further discussion? All those in favour? Okay, thank you. We'll move to item 23.8.3, the supply of water to large residential lots. Can you drop? Yes. Julie. Yep. Right, so um, I'll take the report as read. Um, so a request has been received from the developer of Shannon Farm at Rippendale for an on-demand water supply for 170 large lots, which range from 1,500 square metres to 6,000 square metres. Uh, this triggered a discussion regarding the potential risk for high water use to irrigate these properties. The developer has subsequently proposed a separate articulated irrigation supply for these properties, which will be fed from the private or to avoid having to have uh, a water restrictor and the tanks and that that are associated with wet on each property. So as part of the consideration of the developer's request, staff considered the risk that residents would continue to use the potable supply for irrigation rather than the separate irrigation supply. Um, the current biometric charge is low and it may not achieve the demand and management outcomes desired for some property owners who are able to pay that. So we've reviewed the current charges against a number of other councils, and this has identified that the uniform annual charge in Central Otago is the highest amongst those reviewed, and the volumetric charge is the lowest. So the impact of this is that every property ends up paying more through the uniform annual charge when consumption increases, um, instead of those who are using more paying for the impact of their increased use. So we then considered what the impact would be on ratepayers if the proportion of charging allocated to the uniform annual charge um, was to be reduced and the proportion that of income generated from an adult volumetric charge was increased. And we've shown that on a table in the report. Um, this identified that there is scope to challenge this without impacting on the majority of ratepayers and provide a better demand management tool for those who use much more water. So there are 1,536 residential properties, which are 1,100 square metres or more, um, and only a small proportion of those, about 200, have restrictors. Um, typically, all the, all the large properties that are located within an urban zone area, um, they don't have restrictors. So in most cases, the restricted properties are on networks which actually have insufficient pressure or have not been built to supply an on-demand supply. So if we were to put high pressure through those, that we could start blowing apart and make it lots of leaks. Um, so it would be difficult and, and probably legally impossible to require existing properties over 1,100 square metres which don't have restrictors to install those. So on this basis, we don't believe that requiring restrictors provides an equitable method of managing the demand coming from large lot properties. <laughs> and that using pricing tools would provide a more equitable approach. So volumetric charging is defined as a rate under the rating legislation, so it's not a fee. Um, it, that, so what we would propose is that further work be undertaken to identify what the options are, <coughs> some changes, and, to con and, and for that to consider the balance between achieving a water conservation and efficiency need um, against the financial stability and sufficient cost recovery, because the benefit of the, of the uniform annual charges you know how much you're going to get every year, whereas if the volume consumption changes, you're not sure about what the income is going to be. So these options would then be referred to council for further consideration, and they would need to be included in the LTP with public consultation undertaken. If council agrees in principle to the use of pricing as a demand management tool for large lot developments, then the proposal from Shannon Farm to provide an alternative irrigation supply and on-demand potable water for household use could be approved. Um, and just to give you a little bit of context, so the medium volume of water used last year was 225 cubic metres. So that means that 50% of, of properties use that amount or less. Um, the average amount of water used per connection was 379 cubic metres. 
and that's because because of the distribution there's a, a lot a few properties that produce quite a lot of water um and um because of that actually 75 percent of the connections actually use less than the average amount of so that it's it's quite low and then it suddenly goes up. So we'll, we'll provide more information around that as part of the analysis so what the options could be for charges. Thank you, Julie. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think excuse me, the recommendation is logical with where we're at. Um, it hasn't been around and, and part of the Pong Community Board that probably um, started this whole ball rolling about metering and everything else where we ended up for the right reasons to make sure that those who were using the most were not being um, subsidised by those who were using little. Um, and I recall particularly the challenge between trying to find that that um, uh, right point between the uniform charge and the, and the volumetric charge, because if you looked at it, you can say the cost of actually producing the water are the small end, and, the, and, and um, sorry, the, yeah, the small end, and then there'd be no incentive not to use a whole lot of water. Um, so we came up with that model we've got and it's really appropriate after some probably 20 years now to, to review that and make sure it's still fit for purpose uh, i'm sure that 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 is part of that, that those early reports are still available and to test out what that logic was and if it's still appropriate for today um and, and also make sure that we've got a situation now when we did this work our sections were largely a lot bigger as well and so I think whatever we end up we need to be careful that we don't get an outcome where all of a sudden those that have got those sections that are bigger uh, are paying more than their fair share. And that's all it should be, is about paying your fair share for what you are using. Um, mm -hmm. It was interesting to note in the report, uh, those other examples, that when you look at it, the total cost isn't that far away. No matter how you cut mm -hmm. the pie up, because mm -hmm. that's all you're going to be doing here, is how do I cut the pie up? Yeah. The issue, I think, I wonder with um, Sharon Farm, has done more about saying the ability to actually meet the demand, which I think is separate to actually how you fund on your own costs. So there's two, seems to be two separate issues in there. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you know, I'm sure we were mindful is that if you go back and say, well, there are sections already that are actually on the town supply or meter supplies that are bigger than the square meters. And Ballad is a good example, and then even Moreover as well. And 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 and, that, and how you manage the transition for any changes that might come through. <laughs> so I think the timeliness is bang on, um, and um, I look, look forward to seeing just where we end up, what the options are. Yeah, I I think one of the things that is is changing and we're seeing it really um, quite harshly at the moment as a consequence of the implementation of the Lake Dunstan water supply is the operating costs for um, the higher levels of treatment mm -hmm. um, and electricity costs for pumping water and they are, are going up quite, quite a lot. So, um, you know, we can see much higher operating costs and you're pumping more water through those treatment plants then that costs more money. Whereas before when we had pretty rudimentary treatment methods, it probably wasn't having such a big impact. Well, that's where the challenge is to make sure that you get enough in your revenue yeah. fix to cover those yeah. costs. Because if, if you put up a, a low uniform charge and a high mm -hmm. uh, volumetric charge, then people stop using and then all of a sudden you can't fund the actual cost of producing water because you're not getting the income to stop using water. Some of those only start to change. So yeah. there's a sensitivity analysis that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, on that, and with Neil's thoughts as well, I'd like to see if, as part of that analysis, there would be some sort of hybrid model because I think we need to consider is it going to be that whoever has got money can use as much water as they want, or like you say, do we actually want to be encouraging people to reduce their water consumption? And whether that is going forward some sort of hybrid model whereby the charges, the volumetric charges increase, but actually properties over X size will have a restrictor, recognising that a lot of those properties are of a size where they can actually have on-site storage as well, if they're wanting to have a lush green fern garden or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see all options for going forward into the future considered as well as opposed to just what's fit for purpose now. Yeah, what, what happens when you put the restrictor on is that they only get a certain amount of water per tap day and it goes through at a trickle. So you're basically giving them an allocation per day, um, regard, regardless of what's, what their demand might be. Um, I think um, we had talked about whether or not there might need to be a, a stepped system that will, over a certain use, that's considered extraordinary use would be on the right. Um, we are working um, through um, reviewing what the options are around implementing smart measures. Um, we're not quite at a point where we can do that yet. We, um, 
working in with water care who are currently going through a procurement process for this. Um, that procurement process that their job should be completed at the end of January. Um, and then we'll be able to look at the time and like that to enable the smart rollout or the rollout of smart meters. The problem with that is that it actually does, it's not just the meter going in, you've actually got to have the infrastructure at the other end to collect the data from the, the meters. So um, it's not just as simple, unfortunately, as going and replacing all the meters. So it's going to take us a wee bit of time to work through, but that kind of technology will give um, much better understanding of extraordinary water use and, and it's used, able to be used by both the consumer and the water supplier. So I think we're going to have to be really careful with the changing weather patterns mm -hmm. and how that's going to impact our demand and whether or not we'll be able to service demand before all on, on demand mm -hmm. flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah a couple of things. I plan with um, I see later on their financials that we're 714k down in anticipated revenue. So this needs overall to look at. Um, it's interesting to hear almost diametrically opposed because Neil's saying fair share in terms of saying big sections because they can afford to pour in water on, and you saying, well, we've got these systems that are costing a lot to run. So I think foreshadowing the debate that isn't for today is how do we is there a does the rating act allow Cost things that will change, drive behavioural change. Um, so, are we allowed to stage it to the point where people will go, well, I'll put a door in because it's cheaper? We're putting treated water on. That's for another day. But one thing I'd say is that as a nation, um, and, and CODC doesn't fall into the category as hard as the other 48 rural or provincial councils that don't even bother meeting, uh, metering their water as a nation. We've undervalued our water for too long. And I've got, I'll take some convincing that it's a good idea to. To use treated water to water 6,000 square metres. Look, I, well, I, that's for another day. Yeah, and I think the other part of this conversation that we haven't, I didn't put in my summary, is that we know that there are changes coming in the way that the consenting process works for allocation of water. Um, and we got some pretty good heads up on that when we went through the Plan Change 7 environmental process. And so we need to be conscious that there will be more requirements on demand management coming on council in the future. Or we'll just do it again. So, no, just to clarify, other within the district, um, reticulated water supplies where capacity is, is potentially a problem. Um, so, Cromwell um, is, has probably got the biggest issue because of the growth that's gone on there. So, we will need to. When we so that the long term plan is to combine both the PISA and the Kimball um, into one one network. Um, even when we combine that volume, the volumes from both of those consents, there is a point in, in the not too distant future where we will exceed the current consented volume. Um, so when we go for a new resource consent, we will have to apply for an increase in volume. And we would expect that that would probably have some demand management requirements around it. So a lot of that, um, obviously we've done the metering, so that's actually a really good, we're a step ahead of a whole lot of organ um, councils on that, but um, this education processes and everything that we would be expected to be rolling out. The court was actually speaking about um, having different education programs targeted at different types of users, so it's not even just putting an advert up on Facebook and be quite happy with it. Because there's, there's a distinction between using demand management for maybe a step regime of charging your volumetric, volumetric and protecting your capacity. Mm -hmm. And and presumably with this further further analysis, um, <coughs> that that will suppose that is there is there any potential impact for industrial industrial so that's, that, uh, that needs to be looked at as part of that analysis. Um, under the water legislation that comes through this consumer agreement, so there's different kinds of agreements for different types of users. I don't know what the detail of all that is, but you know that's that's kind of an expected future thing. Is that it would be? Um, and some councils have different charging mechanisms on commercial versus um, residential. A lot of councils already. While they don't do universal metering, they already meter commercial users. So that there's yeah, a lot of ways that that's being looked at across various councils. Yeah, 
Well, you can say because Tim, Tim raised a good point about you know, that Taylor and I could be directly opposed. <clears throat> I think that what I expect that this work will identify is saying that is being able to make your brass green, for want of a better word, <clears throat> um, to the, the right level as opposed to the over level, which generally happens, um, any different than, than, than someone's industrial or commercial use, um, especially when you have got um, a community where it's been set up to provide for that. And, and so the thing that gives me some heart is that if you look at other models you've got for um, things like water, and electricity is the obvious one, there's, there's a pretty clear way of being able to look and, and, and charge more for those that are the, the you know, the, the higher capacity ones, but you get a higher supply charge. There's all those sort of options out there. Mm. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the work that comes out is going to consider all of those things to work out what is, and it does have to be an element of fairness about it. Um, and, and if you can't afford, that's one thing. The challenge would be, as you've said, about what's going to happen to the availability of water going forward. Um, but, you know, I suggest that there's going to be a huge, um, if the quantity is water unavailable for irrigation for the residential or DSA, um, the, the, um, the pastoral areas, then there's going to be a huge um, reaction from the community about that. But, and, and look, that's where you start having to do things like put restrictions in place and things like that. Yeah. So there, there's a whole rack, there's a whole toolbox of things that you can do. Um, and, and, and the worst thing is, you know, we've had <clears throat> significant development over a large number of years in Central Otago and talked about, thought about putting separate irrigation systems in for, um, you know, other, other news part of the week. Some subdivisions have done it. You know, Prospector Park is a good example. Um, you know, that makes a big difference. We do have and we've done it as a council. Internally, that we're working on yeah. working through at the moment, not only that for council, but I would say is actually council is the biggest we use that yeah. in central Tango. That comes from balls as well. I know this is the meter, just looking at me, yeah. yeah. the biggest yeah. water user. Wow. Yeah, by a long shot. Mm. It's all those greenways and gravel. And the rest of the Um, yeah. In your report, you talk about restrictors being applied to the last section, but the reason you tampered them. Do you know how many are being tampered with? Is, oh, is just the mythology. Um, we know anecdotally that um, it's not an unusual thing for them to be tampered with. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is actually, we don't probably check them as often as we should be checking them. Yes. But we know that it's been a historical on some properties. Because that's the, I mean, that's the downside of restrictions, isn't it? Because what's the point of implementing them if they are sabotaged? And then if they're being sabotaged, we're not cheating if they are sabotaged, then yeah. what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I, I think in our planning when we went through this is to some extent that this is vulnerable and restrictive. Issue, um, unless it's being used because to manage the um, the, the the ability to supply demand on some particular infrastructure, um, it's it's kind of yeah, it's just bolted. Yeah. Sorry, just, 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 sorry. If I come up extending that so with reference to your uh, reference to prospect to park, will further reports look at how we could possibly incentivise developers to use um, and put the system of pondwoods and, and other uh, treated water irrigation purposes, especially in large lot subdivisions, which we're going to be seeing a lot more, especially through Plan Change 19 in this part of the world. And, and Alex? Um, no, that wasn't part of the scope of work that we were proposing to have done by the FGP, but it could be something that gets done. Um, separately, but we didn't have the reasons to get that done ready for an hour to pay. Um, Conversation okay. over the next over the next five months, we've probably got just too much. Uh, yes, it, I totally understand. Yeah, and I think sorry, the prospect of part one thing is for reserves and greenways, not for joke. Joke yeah. up here, but isn't I just explaining that is that that's where the future lies, isn't it? Is, is in on systems. Yeah, look, I don't want to really get into that because that's a regional council yeah. issue, and if they issue a sense for those, and I'm not sure. What 
I think it's fair to say that implicit in these recommendations, especially recommendation C, is that we are, as a council, we're, we're assuming that um, water restrictors are not a tool to be used in water management. That, that I think, is what, it, what is, the, is the effect of if we approve the recommendations. And I just want everyone to be happy, to be clear that that's what we're. Can I just check in what you said, the Nigel water restrictors moving forward? We're not looking at correct. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Going back that, 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 that is what I that, that's, that, that is the we adopt recommendation C. Um, that I think that is the, the, the practical impact of that is the water restrictors are no longer regarded as a, as a potential tool. Is that fair comment? Yeah, look, it's, um, you know, I think it, it would be very difficult to um, require a developer to put restrictors in where there's large numbers of properties that are large that don't have restrictors. I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I would imagine the ability to argue that in the Environment Court um, would be, you have, you know, I was on that side arguing that, I think I see that as being the um, argument that you've already met a lot of properties that are large and not have restrictors. So how can you make one particular development in the future happen? Well, I think with some things there will need to be a line in the sand. Yeah. And say so from this day on, because mistakes have been made in the past on yeah. lots of issues, and just because that's the way it's always been done. Yeah. If the, the analysis, of, I think that all options should be considered. Yeah, oh, what, uh, as uh, Janice has just pointed out to me, and in some places there might be, uh, you've got to put a higher quality infrastructure in it to have on pressure, uh, pressurised networks. So if there's places where they don't have the right kind of infrastructure, they'll still need to have a restrictor. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's a straight technical yeah, problem. That's a technical issue. Yeah. The pressures are you going to put a restrictor in. Yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I think also that in terms of recommendation C, it could well be that if it is adopted and further work is done, you could well see a recommendation for a step regime of charging mm -hmm. um, on, on wherever the uniform charge arrives at. You could, you, you could see a regime where um, further use increases uh, the volumetric charge. Yeah. Any further comment? Okay, so we have four recommendations A, B, and C. A, that we receive the report and accept the level of significant. B, direct staff to undertake further analysis to support consultation on changing the proportion of the uniform annual charge and the volumetric charges for water use in the 2024 long term plan. C, agrees in principle subject to further work. That volumetric charging be used as a demand management tool for water use on large residential lots of 1100 square meters or larger. Um, sorry, just they yeah, just read it out, which is good. Uh, is C going to us to just volumetric charging? Because I think, I think that, that C actually allows you to have the look at volumetric charging and not looking at UAC and it's the combination oh, that no. would worry no. us. Mm. Sorry, only when you read it out. Can we volumetric out and just say charging? And on that, does it also need to specify the size of a lot? Yes. Because wouldn't it be applicable to yes. demand on all section? Yeah, I just think, yeah, I hate to think, I'm sure you wouldn't. Sorry, I hate to think you wouldn't take any notice of it. You probably would do block what it says, but we might as well put in place and not tie you down to say, well, we can only do this. And I think Tamin's point is, yeah, section size yeah. as well. It's use that you were talking Demand about. Demand management yeah. full stop, not necessarily a large section. Yeah, I stress true. what I'm saying, what I needed was um, a little bit of clarity around the fact that we, as um, an officer of council, when I am providing advice around the conditions to go on a resource consent on large lots, that's kind of outside the normal things that we would provide that I'm able to say councils agreed that we will use charging as a mechanism to manage the demand on these lots. And those lots are, I think, we are over 100 square metres. So 
it, it is useful for me just to have a little bit of clarity around that direction. Um, and but you're right, as soon as you do that, it applies to everything. Mm -hmm. And I guess the done first, yet, so. and just using residential lots, what's residential? Um, is yeah, that well, the area or is that um, bad burn, low burn, you know? It's just, anywhere that's residential and, and the, I don't think we would have considered this development originally to be a residential area, but it's now going to become a residential yeah. area, so. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot size. Talk whether it's residential or industrial, it's usage. Usage is the yeah. is the management of people. Res residential being defined by being on one of our stems, and then the usage dictates from there. Mm. Yeah, I, I just wonder if seeds actually. I know what you're saying. The one is actually required, or is it? I it would be incredibly helpful to me to have seen here because of the, the, the um, direction some of the conversations have been taking internally. It just gives me something to um, have confidence around that this is the approach we're taking for this. Well, isn't, this isn't that the same type then? Actually, carry on doing what we do, reinforce it, saying actually until we make a change, we acknowledge that the Uniform UAC and biometric charging is used as the demand management tool for a large residential lot greater than 11 square because that's what we're currently doing. 60 cents isn't necessarily going to achieve that. No, no, but, but it's, it's the principle that the, the, we can review the, 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 the problem every year as part of our rates. So. I just I, I just wonder whether if we change the recognition C and just to, to say, Agrees in principle subject to the work of volume metric charging being used as demand management. We would use use that. Would that work for you, Joy? Uh, just take out the large as neutral lot. Yeah, I'll just go away with comfort that we discuss large lots here in the subdivision. That I'm clear that that means it applies to that. Well, at, at the end of the day, uh, Nigel agrees in principle subject to the work. If, if through the work comes in and stuff work, yeah. then we can fix it. Yeah. I think we move on, give Julie what she needs now. So it's come back to us in short order and we can contemplate it a bit more through that. I think the message is clear um, because it is the usage. So maybe the large residential neutral lots aren't that relevant. I don't think that. Mm -hmm. Like it's never an issue on small residential lots. Yeah, so sorry, what will we chat? Is C what you're currently doing? No, it's not. C and C, when we get a large, you know, when we get 170 lots, we would say you need to put a restrictor on those um, because we can't guarantee those people won't use that water for irrigation under the current funding charging mechanisms. And so it's too bad. I, I know people, you know, and, and I'm one of those people who has an irrigation supply. I know what I pay for my irrigation supply. 60 cents cubes cheaper than what I pay for my irrigation supply. I'm happy to move over and see as it is, and it's going to come back to us and we can all have those details. Change. Well, um, no, I've never changed on the distance here. No, okay. Is this the agenda? I just. Sorry, Tony. Yeah, I don't know that it leads to, say, large residential lots over. I don't know. Then, as that first time, she's got a 100 metre square section, and they're looking at that saying, well, it doesn't apply to me. Because a 900 or a 1,000 metre section is still a very large section in a residential area. And I would worry that that would then. That it's not okay. So this land's actually rural zoned, so um, it's not residential, it's not urban zoned. It's, 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 it's the discussion is yeah. resonant with yeah. here on the yeah. yeah. thinking. You'll still have the same tool. It's not excluding the large residential lots, it's just bringing in everybody if we take those words yeah. out. Okay, that, that's fine. All right, well, I'll change your set. I'll move what you had up then. I'll just bring it up again. Yeah, I'll just move it Just wait out the last five words or so. Ah, oh, pretty much. Yeah. That'll give you what you need, Julie, and then it comes back to us in a few minutes. If you need to type it up from there, we can look. Yeah. Right, I'll move that. Yeah. Second look. Run. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Okay. Against. 
Okay, thank you. Move on to item number 23.8.4, waste water and staging notices updates. Two. Right. And um, so I'll take this report for this week. Um, the, the, the key things that are different in this report from last month, um, I've just noted that um, all the roles within the three waters area have now been filled. And we have, bear in mind, we haven't gone out to the market to try and get another water manager. Um, there's a delay in start dates for two roles. And I think, um, you know, we've been really hit by um, the, the rush of people going overseas. Um, so we have people going off on staff have been overseas for a month or longer and um, people who are starting are all work also going overseas which is delayed start dates so by the time we um hit november we will have everybody in the office off leave and fill roles um we have um even though we've been short short staff that um reports annual reports for names being only have got submitted to the oic as well as that with this work extensions to the abatement notices were submitted um, in plenty of time. Um, that I, I put more information into this report regarding um, the impacts on funding um, for this, the work that's needing to be done. Um, at the moment, the work that's being approved is within our budgets. However, um, you'll notice from the programs that I attached that there's work that's being pushed out to 2024. 25 and beyond that um, will have to get included in the long term plan. So, anything that's significant expenditure, which actually, when we looked at it, the process to get to the point of actually being able to do that work means it wouldn't actually be able to be progressed fast enough anyway. Um, but there, it is going to impact on the 2024 25 LTP. Um, in particular, the requirement to get um, an additional processing. Um, piece of equipment in place to deal with the um, nitrogen limits. So we've had that in our long term plan since 2018. It was, it was identified when we did the upgrade at Cromwell um, for the membrane treatment plant that we would need to put an additional process in, in the future to remove nitrogen once population got to a certain point. And every three years we've been bringing that forward three years because of the population growth being higher and was anticipated that year. So um, it's not unexpected, but it's sooner and of course everything's costing more money now than it did when we first program these things. Um, Alexandra the gear box has been installed um, which was good. The estimated cost for that $65,000 so we're funding that from our plant renewal budget um, which means that's taken a priority for that funding um, and look I will acknowledge that Paul Logan have actually done quite a lot of work at Rampoon and they see no sites in the really really good now. Um, Yes, sir. Any questions? Questions, yeah. um, The first one is it's kind of operational. In those critical infrastructure areas where we need people there, is there like a minimum number for staff? If two people are on leave, no one else can have leave that month or whatever it is, or is that something that we need to look at in the future? Um, uh, yes, it is. Um, that the trade off there sometimes too is that. Um, I think what's happened in this case is we've had four years of people not being able to go away overseas and they and in my department the people who've been overseas is either them or their spouse, their families overseas. And so I think if we had said no, you can't go, we might have lost staff. Um, so it was certainly a consideration, um, but there's also a balance of what those people need to contact with their families. Sometimes it's it's the trade off for the job that you do. Having spent 12 years of didn't get Christmas off the year because someone else did. I think we're probably going to have to, I don't know, look at something yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I, I would say that getting good staff in the water space is an incredibly challenging thing. Yeah. 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 The second thing that I just wanted to cover off was I have some substantial concerns that we have gone back to ORC and said we are going to be doing monthly audits and come July it was not done. Oh, I don't think you said we're doing monthly audits on everything. We are going, we went out and did some audits in July, but we're not auditing. We've focused the audits on the things that actually matter around wastewater. Our, our monthly audits on water treatment sites are not part of the ORC abatement notices. They're just a practice that we have finished at the same time. But 
to recognise that it was full practice to do it. Because it does say in here, we are doing monthly audit. In, yeah. in the next paragraph, it says we didn't do monthly audits in July. So um, we did. We did monthly audits on the wastewater treatment sites. We didn't do them on the water treatment sites. And it's the wastewater sites that have got the abatement businesses that we. Because that one says site audits have not been undertaken in July due to reduced resourcing. Yeah. And the one oh, yeah, okay, page thirty two. August. Yeah. 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 So is yeah. that something that's prioritised or not prioritised? Um, We've got one operational engineer at the moment and another one started um, that they've been out on the sites with Beaker and Beaker have been at the site. So while there hadn't been um, proper audits taken where they've recorded everything, um, there's been people on site looking at things and giving it staff training on how to do things. Because that's where we came on site last time, was that things yeah. weren't being recorded. Um, I think one month's different to 13 years. Yes, yeah. agree. Yeah, but I think we need to be yeah. setting the standards, and actually, this is the standard. Yeah, look, if I had been able to find consultants or contractors to come in and fill those roles, I would have done so. The reality is, those people are not available either. Um, yeah, but, and, and it's the state of the water industry. And I, I you, well, you've heard me talk, you know, I despair at the fact that we had increasing requirements put on us in a period when it's reduced people to do work. And at some point, that's going to be a breaking point in the industry. Um, yeah, I, and I don't have a solution to that. There's something called water reform that might help them. Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Two questions. Um, Julie, the, the discussion on the fencing at the Ranfurly site, options are coming back in November. I'm just wondering, that to me, we've seen from just reading those three lines would be something that's operational. If we haven't got the site fenced properly, the site needs to be fenced properly. There's no option, even if it means an underlying budget, so we need to get on with that. So there's not just a Ranfurly site, there's probably another few sites that we want to have a look at around Denson too, and those costs are going to be reasonably sizable, and um, I don't have delegated authority to overspend budgets, so anything that is going to result in an overexpenditure, I have to do that for you. Just obviously. Unless you that. want to say, well, looking down the road, it's looking down the road, yes. Yeah. You know, the, the, the cost is one thing, the price is another, isn't it? Um, but if that's how the system works, then we just need to get on with it as urgent because yeah. we don't want a tragedy. The other question I had was at the very end where it says Bill to know again, <coughs> got a dedicated operator on the plant, which is great. Um, there was a drop on the performance in the site when this person was on leave. Did that mean that there was no one there or no one there? No, they kept done? someone there. I think what I'm noting there is what a good job the person who's there right. all the time does. Okay. Um, because it really got to know the site really well, and, and we actually could see that it was a little bit of a drop, a wee bit of cloudiness coming through to clarify I mean, um, when the person who's there all the time is alone. So, what actions are a contractor taking to ensure that if that person gets hit by a bus or gets it or something, that somebody there is, is of a similar thing? We'll raise that with them. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, it amazed me, waste of trips, so $123,500 except one of the software, that's first of wage. Um, so that's, um, that software is actually for the entire district, it's not just for... Yeah, it's not for the it's, Asia, yeah, it? it's, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't divvy them up across the different things, it's, but it's actually for all the info waste water and it's helping us with our um, annual reporting on that um, okay. compliance monitoring as well. And we're all already seeing huge benefits from that software. Can I, can I just kind of clarify uh, the points that Taylor raised, Julie? Um, uh, we're, we're doing a monthly audit on wastewater and drinking water. Yeah. Uh, and, and the wastewater is in terms of the ORC debate notices. And the reason we didn't do it um, mostly or in the drinking water is because of resource issues. So, so there's nothing that says you have to do a monthly audit, but you need to be confident that your contractor is doing what you expect them to do. 
And so we have been doing some monthly, monthly audits um, to ensure that the things that should be happening monthly are happening monthly. Uh, we took a leap of faith in July because we didn't have anything available on the wastewater sites. We're, we also are going out and looking at all the water treatment sites to make sure that the things that should be happening are happening. Yeah, that's, yeah, there's nothing written down that says we have to do it, but it's around how do you make sure as a, as a client and ultimately we're accountable um, that things that should happen, happen, and you can't do that You're sitting in an office and not looking at things. So, um, Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, probably other points that uh, I'd like to make is that when you look at the proposed capital expenditure for Cromwell, um, it highlights what I think has been the situation for some years is that we've consistently underestimated the growth within Cromwell and we're playing catch up. And um, hopefully, this by bringing forward the proposed expenditure in the 24 25 year, we will. We will we take as part of that work of uh, uh, um, putting in the nitrogen mitigation. We will be looking at the overall capacity of the Cromwell wastewater system and ensuring that we've got a plan for active growth over the next 10, 15 years as opposed to um, um, when we have been possibly behind the eight ball. So, uh, any further questions? Oh, no. Yeah, so just, to, just to, I suppose in terms of our relationship with IRC, um, I'm assuming that it's, it's, it's working together to, to get the outcomes that are appropriate and right, as opposed to um, we just want to um, make someone, um, um, you know, find someone or prosecute or whatever. I would say we have a good relationship with IRC, um, and they are happy with what we, they can see that we're actively dealing with issues and, and making improvements. Even the fact that we um, are doing this report to council every yeah. month is that they were impressed by that. That's not something that happens everywhere else. Okay. okay. So I've got a recommendation that the report be received. A move up. Discussion? All those in favour? No. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Yes, Thank you, Kevin. Um, Neil, there's yours. Thank you. Right. 223.85 is the um, the technology to work our uh, Pivot Valley Spatial Plan, the engagement document. And Anne, I think you're going to present that to us. So, yeah, I've got. All of this is important. Yes, very good. With your capital hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as councillors will be aware, uh, the council approved the development of the Tibet Valley Spatial Plan in July of last year. Um, so we've been working away with the community and with our other stakeholders on that since then. Um, so this will be the third one. Again, um, this is something that councillors will know. This will be the third one council, uh, Secretary of the District Council has undertaken. Um, following Cromwell and the Dog Super Awards. Uh, community engagement started in August 2022 with the establishment of a key stakeholder group um, from various people across the um, valley. And it's worked quite well and we've had quite good engagement. Um, we've tried to reach out to as wide a demographic as we could. Um, the stakeholder group um, came along to a full. They uh, facilitated um, IOM options type workshop um, with rationale, and um, we identified on the day that there were four um, problem statements that you'd be familiar with the IOM process. So, this is what the community stakeholders that we worked with on that day came up with um, as priorities um, improving economic diversity and delivering a sustainable economy, improving housing quality and diversity. Um, to attract and retain residents, improve visitor participation in the valley, so holding the visitors a little bit longer, um, making some visitors um, understanding and embracing the blocks which the heritage. So that was the, the what the community um, stakeholder group established. Um, they thought about yeah, so I think in terms of undertaking this work. Um, following this, we had some public meetings um, held in Lake Roxburgh 
village Ettrick and Lillis flat. Um, so that was just invites open to anyone. Um, extremely good turnouts in Ettrick and Lillis flat. Both halls were full and um, the communities there were very engaged. Um, clearly very different communities, which is great to understand um, what their priorities are. Uh, we also had uh, Lake Roxburgh Village, not as many people, but um, still some, some good engagement there. Um, Following the meetings, we went back to the stakeholder group and we had um, an optionary workshop. It's something that um, I guess some councils that have been here for a while will um, be familiar with in terms of what's happened with the Vincent Spatial Planning most recently. Um, so the stakeholder group got together and we had another day of um, understanding what they thought their vision was for 30 years um, and what the options were. The groups came to a number of different options about where they thought um, the uh, the valley, the various segments in the valley should grow um, with an understanding of the constraints, some of them being infrastructure and others being natural hazards, um, which is um, one of the things that um, we have been working on has taken us a bit longer to pull this together than we'd anticipated. We have um, some issues with alluvial fan hazards in and around the Roxbrook Township, which we've been extremely careful with. Um, and so we have been engaging with um, the Otago Regional Council on that in terms of their hazard database. Uh, there are some, a couple of areas that are affected that are existing in areas, so we're being extremely cautious about that. Um, that's quite a high level document and some more work needs to be done. So we've identified it as that in the, in the document, but we can't ignore the fact that it is identified on the Otago Regional Council Natural Hazard Database. So. But it does, we do need to think about it and what that means and what the risk might be um, in terms of rock fall or damage. So at the moment, we're not providing any additional density in there. And in fact, Plan Change 19 has come over the top and increased the minimum lot size in that area anyway. So, um, but at the moment, we're not proposing any um, increase in the density of development in those areas. Um, so more work we'll be doing on that rock fall issue there. Uh, infrastructure is another one that's interesting for the Teviot Valley. Uh, there's no reticulated waste for the water supply in Dietrich, for example. Um, so they're reliant on there is a, um, a community scheme. We can't seem to find a little of that. Um, but um, we think it's quite limited and, and not so much in the township. So um, smaller sections are harder to manage because they're in the ground of the protection zone as well, which means that Putting in septic tanks is also challenging. So there's a few things that we need to work through with that. Um, so it is a little bit challenging. So for Edric, we've taken a slightly different approach. Um, and we've thought about establishing what we call the settlement zone. So it's not providing for um, a lot more density as such, but it is providing for a settlement zone would enable um, a mixture of low-level commercial and um, residential. So it would enable a level of development without identifying new zones or intensifying too much. But we still do need to, at some point, address the, um, the infrastructure. So, um, for example, um, there's a, a cafe in Roxborough. They had to put in a, a, a septic system to deal with the, the additional visitor accommodation there. So um, it, it is something that we need to think about, and it is a challenge for the area. Um, Millers Bay is similar. Um, Millers Bay has a good water supply, community run water supply that um, appears to be quite good. Um, and again, they're on septic tanks, so they have slightly different priorities. Um, Millers Flat has a small school that's well supported by the community. Um, but the school is at risk, so um, the, the, the focus for the, the Millers Flat community was around ensuring that that school retained its viability and trying to get families to come in there. So um, it's been a really interesting process for us. Um, the, 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 and sometimes, another time when we've done um, spatial planning exercises, we've looked at a number of options and we've taken a number of options to the community. With this one, because of the scale, it's a lot smaller. Um, we've combined what we know in terms of um, discussions with key stakeholders and, um, and what we know about the constraints around infrastructure and natural hazards. And we've come up with a plan that we think kind of combines all of that. Uh, one really interesting thing with the optioneering workshop um, was that um, the, a majority of the people in the room 
um, because the, the numbers we're talking about are quite low. So a majority of the people in the room thought that we should be aiming for aspirational growth. So aiming for more than, than what the growth figures were. And it's not a lot of numbers. I think it's three. 360 to 540 is what we're talking for. So it's an additional 50%, but that's what the community has indicated that they would like us to. Thank you. <laughs> um, one of the other really big considerations for the Tibet Valley is um, we have a lot, uh, it's very productive. So there's, um, we have to consider the highly productive land. And it's something that's really important to the community, and it came through quite strongly in the auctioneering workshop as well. And it um, feels representatives from Hawk New Zealand and some options here as well. So, um, so we tried to combine all of that, keep it, keep it tight, think about the highly productive land, think about the hazards and the constraints. Um, and this will be the first time that it's been tested publicly. Um, we have at and we have tested it with the stakeholder group. So we tested the first round of plans that we had and they gave us some feedback and we responded to that. The feedback that we got was around providing for large lot residential. So we provided for a bit of that in, in around the outskirts of Rossborough that came through um, and also a little bit in Miller's flat as well. So we've responded to some of the feedback. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, so the settlement zones is a, is a, a new thing um, for this kind of uh, spatial planning exercise, but it is something that we do have at the moment in the district plan. We have what Lauder, for example, is a settlement zone that's provided for in the national planning standards. So it will be a new type of zone for us, but it does seem to fit a smaller community where identifying three lots that are commercial and five that are residential doesn't seem quite the right way to do it. So it allows for that mixture um, of activities. Um, and the only other thing that we, uh, will be a bit of a shift is medium density in that kind of central part of Roxborough in and around where the commercial area is which is uh, relatively free from any hazards or anything like that. So um, our early settlers really knew what they were doing because the older part seems to be quite free from, from all those hazard constraints. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Paula and I are, are working on Tom's plan at the moment. We'll be doing drop-ins and surveys and things like that and hope to get it out in the next couple of weeks. There are a few things in the document that have been backed up that um, are not quite right. It's very much draft. <laughs> um, and apologies for that. There was a couple of typos that made their way from Word into InDesign that should not be used. But we are going to iron all of those out. But happy to receive any feedback. Thanks, Anne. Um, just a couple of things. Um, you mentioned about the natural hazards in the RC database, which I understand to be very, very high level um, desktop. Can we expect, can we really expect that as part of the process that we might get some more refinement of that information? Because without that, I have the question about the value of, of giving yeah. the expectations to a community when you've got a um, a high level desktop that's been stacked over pieces of land that, that may or may not be real. Yeah, no, and that was a, a very real reservation. We've had um, several meetings with Taylor Regional Council and Akaha, who we be really closely with. Um, Louise and I had another subsequent meeting with Jean Paul from, um, from uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, from the Taylor Regional Council. Um, and um, so we are actively looking at doing that rock full piece of work um, as part of this process of working with the Otago Regional Council. They do have some significant concerns, particularly around that, that yeah. rock full area, and, and they are obvious, and they're, they're kind of in areas where we already know. They're areas where we've already got issues around um, flooding when we have those heavy intense rainfalls. So they are, they are issues that even the community hasn't really gone, we don't know about that, yeah. because we do know, and the risk is, as explained by the Regional Council um, manager, is that uh, with the more intense rain, that what his concern is that if we don't do a piece of work on what that rock fall might look like, that we could end up with it fans out, so it comes down and it fans out. And the worst case scenario, obviously, would be that it hurts somebody or damages property or both. Yeah. And we really do want to kind of manage what look, or at least at the very least understand it. So yes, you know, and so, that's a good question. So why, why is that a Tiger Regional Council doing the work? It, it's a combination of both of us. Yeah. Any other yeah. questions? And um, I think the document looks really good. And I thought it was quite exciting that those communities want to be so aspirational yeah. in their plan. 
Um, you've probably already got it, but apparently nobody in the 30s lives in Rochford. Yes, which I think it was probably. We are going to look at the grouping. The numbers are small, but yeah, we will look at the grouping. That has already been. We've looked at that a couple of times. Yes, they're selling for a start. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
receive the report and to agree to copy and notify the engagement cycle of the feedback. So we'd like to move. Mark, second that. Sally. All about? Aye. Aye. Against? Gary. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Neil. Excuse the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 33.8.6. Uh, breach spirit. We've got the new way on for a good new while. Yeah. And a few people on the table and all sorts of exciting news. Thank you. Um, we'll make the report as quickly as we know. Central Otago District Council has an ageing network of bridges. Um, over the next 10 years, we've had approximately $20 million worth of replacements. Our current budget for bridge maintenance renewals is 660,000 per annum or 7.6 million over the 10 year period. This replacement backlog will continue over the next 30 years as about labour bridges reach the end of their useful life. So over the past month, we've been working past uh, 12 months, we've been working to understand the bridge maintenance backlog. So um, through the engagement of a specialist bridging engineer and in collaboration with our contractor, um, we have quantified that backlog. So there's an estimated $1.5 million of maintenance and $2.5 million of renewal required to ensure that the assets reach the end of their useful lives. So through this priority, um, this proposed priority will be given to bridges which are strategically the most important and carry the highest risk to the network. Many other councils are also entering a bridge replacement cycle. We receive 51% funding subsidy from Waka Kotahi for bridge and structure component renewals. And Waka Kotahi is responding to this um, bridge replacement cycle throughout New Zealand by setting a clear criteria to qualify for funding. So any applications for bridge funding must have strongly considered all options and whole of life costs, including potentially reducing levels of service, seeking third party funding, and potential divestment or closure. So indicatively, some of the existing 30 bridges due for replacement in the 10 years may not meet Waka Kotahi's requirements to receiving subsidy. So the approach to bridge renewals and replacements mm -hmm. need to accompany the funding application to Waka Kotahi to provide evidence that Council has considered the above issues to support the proposed increase of funding. So our goal is to approach is to um, commence initiatives that will reduce the projected gap in service levels over this next three year period. So this is done through maximising the lives of our bridge assets. So reinstating regular inspections and addressing our maintenance backlog. Lifting funding towards bridges, so seeking an, an increase in renewals and maintenance budgets to um, avoid any long term network instability and look for other innovative um, funding opportunities. Um, such as the um, direct investment or seeking third party funding alongside that. Um, so optimising service levels of bridges with that available funding. So having that replacement strategy and that potential rationalisation of assets and around reducing replacement costs. So working with um, and collaborating with councils around um, particularly those inspections and the need for specialist bridging engineers, innovative procurement, streamlining consenting, and seeking standardizations where possible. So um, if we need multiple eight to 10 meter structures, having a standard 12 meter structure that can span those links and stronger and regular engagement with the community and Waka Kotahi to manage expectations. So I just want to touch on that um, a little bit more detail around optimizing service levels to meet available funding. Um, so there's a proposed prioritization matrix and that prioritization matrix balances detour length against the Waka Kotahi ONRC classification. And that um, is basically how many people use that um, section of road. So the vehicles per day. So it, it balances um, the effect on the number of people versus the alternative access detour length. And this is an approach um, that Southland has undertaken and it's endorsed as best practice essentially by Waka Kotahi in terms of um, they've approved that through their previous funding cycles and provided funding to that. It's around, we are not going to get all the funding we need to address all the bridges we have. Um, so it's around um, taking a prioritised approach to that. In stating that, it is just the first step of a process. A second step is still necessary um, that includes variables and other practical considerations. And that's that present value end of life um, assessment, the PVE or L, um, or an individual business case of each bridge. This is a requirement of Waka Kotahi for funding of any bridge renewals. 
So for that second cut of the program, each bridge will still need to be reviewed individually to determine the flow effects and whether the matrix recommendation is appropriate. As part of the validation, it will be considered whether or not the bridge has a detour available, the detour length, ownership of land either side of the bridge, other industry impacts and other social impacts such as tourism. So in terms of implementation, um, and we'll talk about these as part of the next report as well, um, there are three um, bridges um, currently due for replacement or needing immediate um, repair, and it's the Little Valley Bridge, the Manitoba Road Bridge, and the Scott Lane Bridge. So putting each of those structures through the matrix um, and PVOL's assessments and draft, um, we're proposing um, replacement of the timber components for the Little Valley Bridge in the three year period. Um, the Mini Toto Road Bridge um, through the matrix is replacement and divestment, although that second step of the process needs to happen around is that the most appropriate mechanism, working with the joint landowners and everything around that. Um, and the Scotland Bridge um, is that um, replacement with a lower level structure. Um, or removal, and all of these are subject to Walker Fiji Party funding. Um, but we are working um, through that and with Walker Kotahi around those three structures. Um, so, just back to the recommendations. Um, so, we're looking for um, an approval for the, our approach to bridge inspections, maintenance, and replacements um, to be included in our draft transport activity management plan and continue to refine and define the list. Um, as we move forward um, through between now and December for our final submission to Walker Kota. And back. Thank you very much, Glennon. Um, yeah, it's a pretty thorough mm. and long awaited bridge strategy report. I know people on our corner will be very, very excited about it, but I just noticed the TV plan before, you know, infrastructure is massively important in the, the spatial plans and voting and bridging part of it. Any questions for us? I do. Um, Quentin, I thought um, the Mills Black Bridge was up the list, or is that so, further out in 10 years? Yeah, so as part of all our um, work, we also engaged a, a second specialist bridge engineer to review the lives. Um, so, utilising all the work Becca undertook um, and all those principal inspections, we have readdressed, and some of our bridges are in better condition and have longer life, remaining life. Um, than the existing um, list. So there's an update to all of our lives on our bridges, which has actually shortened or lessened that number um, of structures needing replaced in the next 10 years. Um, and saying that though, there are still some reasonably significant structures in this next 10 year list, including the Ida Valley on Macau Road bridge. Um, but that's not to say that um, that bridge is still in need of replacement, it's just in that next 10 to 20 year window. Um, and again, this is why it's so important having a plan of attack for the next 30 years. Um, so we can start planning for some of those much more significant structures. And I just had another question, and I know that you um, said that you're looking at ways to reduce costs, but in the Hawke's Bay with having to replace so many bridges, have they come up with like a, like a, a lower level bridge or bridges that are more simple, that are easy to construct, that would be cheaper? Yes, but balancing that with the need for resilience and responding mm -hmm. to potential future events and different things like that. So um, we have been talking with Southland um, District Council, um, so they're um, going through this exact um, process, but they had the same number of bridges we have due for replacement in the next 10 year period as we have in total. Mm -hmm. um, so they're doing some really innovative um, procurement, um, so we are looking to tap in to that, and whilst they may be attending a package of 20 bridges, we are hoping to be able to work um, with them around um, potentially tagging on to that um, and, and the benefit of um, standard designs and everything through the Otago Southland period. Yeah. I just wondered, a lot of this is about, I guess, eking out as much life as possible from bridges. Has any work been done either by farmers and contractors or in conjunction with them? to identify preferred routes for heavy vehicles to try and maximise that lifespan? So as as part of this, um, we are looking at those routes and understanding those routes, and it may be that there's three bridges that may be used now, but more investment needs to be placed on one of those bridges to ensure that it can meet those 50 tonne plus requirements um, and a lower level of service structure. Um, is, is provided in those other two areas or no structure is potentially provided in those two areas. So um, 
as, as part of that second stage of that assessment for each of those structures, it's about understanding the flow on effects of, of that region that flows or divest um, around what is the, those priority routes. Good. Thanks, Stuart. Um, this is kind of complicated and kind of simple, isn't it? So the, the, the actual matrix is complicated, but the simple philosophy is it's not going to be first in, first serve. It's going to be based on other criteria looking out over 10 years and a whole lot of other needs. That's where it gets complex. So my question that I'm getting to is for the folk at Scott Lane, who I've got some sympathy for, they've been doing 15, 20 kilometre detours for three years more. Um, this probably won't perhaps be seen as good news, but in the broader picture, it makes sense. If your communications, are they going to read about this in the newspaper or are they going to be communicated once? This has been one presumed given the green light, and what broader communications do we have to yep. explain this to everybody? Yeah, so um, we are proposing um, in the next report around um, our application to Wild Kutahi um, with the option to progress a lower level of service alternative and apply to Waka Kutahi for funding. Um, and working with Waka Kutahi, they have advised us that applying for a replacement structure for that bridge would not attract funding um, in, in, in no simple terms. Um, so we will, we're just in the process of awaiting um, the present value in the blight assessment um, for Manitoba Road 145 and Scott Lane. And that will tell us um, a little bit more information around um, what are the options for that bridge and what is the recommended option for that bridge um, around lower levels of service alternatives in that. And at that point, is we, when we have the information, we can have a robust conversation with that community. Gotcha. Um, and there may be opportunity through that and, and we achieve some funding that the community want, might want to raise and fund something, but we will have our pot for what Walker Katahi will um, come to the party with, um, and then it's, I guess, a wider conversation around that individual structure. Um, but we're putting our best foot forward in, what, um, in an application to Waka Kutahi um, after engaging with them around um, what level of funding we may be able to achieve for that structure. Which we need this next paper for before you can do that. Yeah. Understandable. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, a couple of things. Um, <laughs> the, um, I guess divestment, can you just explain short condensed exactly um, what it involves and why this may or may not be an option for our community in some cases? Because it's going to be a question asked. Yep. Um, so Southland have been going through the process of um, and, and using this matrix and looking at option use for divestment. Um, <coughs> it, has, it, it cannot work in all circumstances, um, although it may um, be a, a logical way of addressing something. Um, if these multiple landowners, how they then structure that um, may add complication. Um, but I think the divestments around um, looking at the opportunity to divest where it is possible and trying to understand if, if it can't be, then it can't be. Um, but if there is one road to one farm with a bridge on it and the road and Bridge can be divested, so upgraded, replaced, um, and divested, and then the asset transferred over. That is a good outcome for council in terms of um, ongoing maintenance and liability of that structure. Um, there's going to be plenty of cases where a bridge will be tagged for the potential of divestment or divestment with replacement and investment. Um, that is not going to be achievable with. So we haven't gone through the process yet of assessing each of those individual ones. Um, and again, that's part of that wider assessment. And that second stage is, is divestment actually achievable? Um, and demonstrating that to Waka Kutaki, and if it's not re-engaging with Waka Kutaki around potentially replacement and retaining or not replacing that structure. Oh, uh, and I guess the, in, your, in the graphs on page 78 of the report, that uh, closing the closing the gap, yeah. which is essentially reducing the level of service, uh, probably following on more from what Tim was saying, is going to be um, a problem for some of those community members that are going to be most affected. Um, if we got, I guess you kind of answered it. What about what are we going to do about maximising their access? So, yeah. So, um, and that's, that's the real importance of routine inspections and those principal inspections and addressing any maintenance um, aspects 
um, early on and trying to maximise the life of those structures. Um, where we have a structure that may be tagged for not being replaced, and then we then work through the PBEOL assessment for that, um, we need to ensure that we're taking all steps we can to maximise that asset life, even if that breach is um, potentially not going to be renewed. And with this matrix, we can give um, an early indication of some of, the, of, of those structures. So we've done the 10 year list um, and we will come back with the 30 year list as well. Um, and then we can start actually having these conversations um, early with those communities. Yeah, because I guess when I looked at the figures in on non-mathematician, however, um, sixty percent of our bridge on that on that just that financial number, sixty percent of our bridges would not be held in council ownership in the future. Twenty-seven percent, or roughly one in four, will not be replaced, and forty percent are guaranteed replaced. Only forty percent are guaranteed replacement and held within council. So that's only on the numbers that we've got in relation to those. So that's. Quite when you're thinking about it from a community perspective, a 60 40 split is quite huge. Yeah, um, but again, that matrix is a first cut in terms of prioritisation. Yeah. And when you get to the yellow and orange of that matrix in terms of considering divestment, and you might not be able to, it's probably going to climb yeah. um, those numbers that do actually get replaced. Um, but it's a first cut of priority. Um, we need to be addressing the bridges with long detours on highly used areas affecting lots of people in the first instance. Okay. And just last thing, I don't believe option two when we get to that point is an, is an option <laughs> because I think the work that you're doing is fantastic and I yeah it's like a reiterating what Stu said. It's great to have some forward movement in this so thank you to mm -hmm. your team. Yeah, yeah thanks <coughs> Stu. Um, just to clarify the matrix that the, we've developed the matrix uh, no, no. So that is um, alongside um, what Southland have done and had approved by Waka Kotahi, yeah. and Waka Kotahi um, have held that up as a good, a good tool for prioritisation. That's good because I thought, is that just something we got with them? Well, it looks good to us that Waka Kotahi aren't going to buy into it. But some of that background that gives me some more confidence. But as much as you could have in some organisations. Um, the word divestment, what does that mean? So, you know, you, you've got an option of replacing and then um, considered investment, you're looking at replacing and considered investment with third value contributions. It means that there's only five people out of the road. Uh, the road might be legal, but we'll sell the bridge in the middle of the legal road to the people who go there, or, or what, how does that work? And we have to be from our side of the bridge that the road ends and becomes private. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's not just as simple as saying you now own the bridge, we still own the road. So you get the bridge and your road, yep. that's quite a complex. And, and, and very, and in terms of what's passed that, I mean, it's, it's, um, if it's one landowner, it may be an easier conversation than one landowner and a dock track. Um, well, that's not simple for the government to pay for that. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, and, 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 and you're laughing at it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you're there. The divestment piece is going to be incredibly complicated yeah. um, to work through. Um, but if a party were to approach council saying, I'll take this bridge on tab for divestment, I'm the only person on this, um, then that might get that action sooner, so yeah. to speak, in terms of we have a clear cut solution for that. Um, the others we're going to have to work through. Yeah, so and, I, and, we, and there are, I mean, we are aware, been made aware of some landowners that would be relatively interested in that whole running divestment thing as well. There would be other issues that we'd love to say. Yeah. People come stop coming up my driveway and love yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You did it. Um, <laughs> I guess it's, a, it's almost the opposite to what council would normally require to take a road on board. It's got to be upgraded, so we have to upgrade it to the best. So mm -hmm. the cost, but then you take away the ongoing need right. for funded appreciation, the ongoing cost, and right. you probably get rid of the trade road as well. Okay, okay. I understand that makes good sense to me. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I've got yeah. one. Uh, well, no, I don't probably should know this, but are all the bridges wood and structured, or some of the bridges lots of big dollars? Or... Yeah, I think that's, that's a mix. And that's a question. Okay. And so anything over three point four square meters in the class classes or structure. Yeah, right. yeah. So and I know with the we've done with earthquake buildings, 
different engineers have given different reports. I mean, life expectancy or size or earthquake prone, our uh, bridge is the same. Yes. I mean, do we know that it is, and, and for this purpose, you know, it doesn't get peer reviewed if we go along and say the structure's okay, what does it look like? Mm. Is that why we got to this point? Because they've got pushed down. We do. We absolutely do. Yeah. Um, and we've done that on some of our structures um, up for um, renewal currently in terms of Little Valley. Um, and that, so we've had certain opinions on the main life of that structure. No, it's just changed it, isn't it? Um, well, it's, we, we've got some um, renewal work planned quite early on in the next long term planning period. And I guess if we don't, who opts to look for subsidy from Mokita and transit and not? I mean, to, to me, it's an averaging process. If we can get four bridges across the line of subsidy and one not, it's an average, isn't it? Is that, do you look at it that way? That's a, where you save on one, you might spend on another? Um, potentially, but I would caveat that with the risk of um, we're looking at three bridges in the next three years. Um, we then have um, at least 30 in the next 10. So we're, we're looking at addressing three problems in the next three years, um, as well as understanding those next 30. And incredibly, I can have this conversation with you in three years today. Um, and that conversation is probably going to be bigger again and a lot more structures. Um, so we're still in a step change process of understanding our bridges and the financial implications and everything like that um, and addressing the first lot. Um, but the next conversation is going to be just as challenging once we've undertaken those PV EOLs um, on the next range of structures for the next three periods. So um, this isn't going away. This is just the beginning. This is start. And these are how they can start. It feels like for a long time we haven't been prepared to start the note at all. Okay. Right. Anyone else have questions? Right. We've got three recommendations. A, B, C, and D. Those are moved. And we'll second those. All in favour, stay on. Right. Those against. Yeah. Thanks, guys. We're a very good lot of work. It's a long time. I know we're we'll getting some of that. All right. Down here, the deep. Yeah, it's fine. Where's the bridge at? No, I'm keeping the road. Bridge. Thank you, Lord. Keep your road. There'll be the smaller structures. I'm, I can't say I'm going to get a lot of confidence, but yeah. I would be my guesses. I'm not going to make this. I'll take it. I'll look at the map because I wanted that too. But I think at the end of the end, it must be like a kind of. Yeah, you get counted down. Yes, not a map. It's just two pockets there. Yeah. 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 And, and I guess that's the thing that's right. Yeah. They're not major contributing to that folders. They come under the bridge strategy if they have to be repaired. And they may not need to be a massive infrastructure. Yeah. Anyway, Carol, 3387. Draft writing budgets is listened to what uh, in New Zealand. So in Germany. Thank you. I'll take a point as read. Um, so alongside um, our long-term development um, and development of the transport, um, we want we have to develop and submit um, our three-year land transport plan to our co-funded work in Kentucky. Um, so just just knowing we have to submit our plan and our budgets tomorrow. Um, yeah. So <laughs> this is the draft. Um, plan, and we will have a further opportunity to refine this draft submission at the end of our final submission, which is due on the 8th of December. And for our draft submission, it's important to, um, that we put our best foot forward. Um, and just, just so what I say, you have a fair um, understanding of um, budget expectation. So, with as a council, um, Roading, um, we're facing significant funding and making stack of challenges, and it does require a revisit of our current energy facility. It costs and our appetite for risk. Um, so, the primary driver for these challenges are inflation, our road maintenance contract leading the bridges, and what we're trying to do funding pressures. So, the cost of all our road inputs have increased between 10 and 20 percent in the past three years. And without an adjustment in budgets to reflect this, the real output of our program will reduce by a corresponding amount. Um, road maintenance contracts, our new contract, um, we have a report coming next around this as well, um, but we're looking at tendering our new road contract uh, during September. 
um, and the real level of um, inflation is likely to be realised at this point. Um, but we should um, be in a position to award and have draft numbers and understand this alongside our final submission to water protection. Um, Bridges, we've just spoken around this about way of replacement and the need um, for addressing that maintenance backlog um, and some of those renewals. In Waka Kotahi, um, there's a large call on funds following the cyclone um, and the government policy statements um, setting those priorities um, has just come out um, the, the election. Um, so amidst this uncertainty, we still must put our best foot forward, um, detailing our priorities to meet our objectives um, for the week. So we do have a range of strengths um, as, as a team, and um, one of those is around our pavement and surfacing assets. So um, our assets continue, continue to perform well and achieve longer lives than expected, um, especially compared with other rowing authorities. Um, so we've been doing comprehensive modelling and assessments of those um, using um, advanced deter deterioration modelling. So we have a really good understanding of how uh, um, pavement and surfacing assets are performing and <coughs> confidently take that level of risk on those and set quite clear budgets to um, maintain that level of service. So we run several different funding scenarios um, to establish the appropriate funding scenario for those assets. Um, good asset management, we're continuing to collect good data and um, make good decisions with those, that data. Um, we're incredibly cost efficient. Um, so this is a really interesting graphic um, in the report. So comparatively across New Zealand, we're one of the most cost efficient networks. We are well regarded with Waka Katahi and often cited as an example of good and pragmatic stewards of the very network. So we're the second most cost efficient network in New Zealand. Um, and these strengths position us favorably to put our best foot forward in this draft submission and request additional funding. So um, there's three options in status quo presented as part of this report. So status quo is around maintaining our current expenditure level. Um, it hasn't been presented as an option um, because um, it will have significant negative effects across um, the whole growing activity. So immediate decline in level of service, reduce lifespan of assets, increase risk of failure, and insufficient budget to even account council staff and overhead costs. And whilst it would have no impact on rates, this is a considered a viable option for continued operation of the road network. So option one um, presented is um, budgets increase to maintain levels of service and address um, immediate um, bridge risk. So this sees the bridge maintenance backlog addressed over a 10 year period. Um, modest, modest increases for unsealed roads, sealed roads, network asset management budgets, and that's mainly to combat inflation, just so we can do what we have the same level of work we're doing now, um, but to counteract some of those increases, there to decreases proposed for the forecast range and uh, our safety promotion, education, and advertising. Um, so this proposed investment level um, represents the minimum level required to sustain our existing service standards um, while tackling the mountain bridge demands, but over a reasonably long-term period, whilst reducing short-term risk with bridges that may result in long-term deterioration on other assets. So option two, um, this is our recommended option. So the budgets are increased to maintain the level of service and address medium term bridge and pavement risks. So a significant emphasis is placed on bolstering our bridge budget to prevent potential bridge closures and addressing the um, bridge maintenance backlog over a span of five years. Um, and we see this as really important because we undertake our um, key structural um, engineering bridge inspections over a six year period. So this would enable us to address the backlog before we go back and ascertain if there's any new problems to address. Addressing that over a longer period puts us as a risk of a, a mountain maintenance problem. Um, and the this um, proposed investment allows us to undertake those PVEOL assessments we spoke of earlier um, over the three year period to come back and have a really good funding picture for the next three year period as well. Um, so advantages of the option is uh, the maintenance backlog is addressed over the five year period. Inflation is accounted for across the activity. We can maintain our current resurfacing and quantities and undertake rehabilitation where it's economic um, and, and that greater investment in asset management to understand um, particularly our risk around bridges and future bridge replacements. And we can maintain our current level of service um, and, and it does have a high rating impact of two to three 
per cent um, per annum. Um, but um, in, in that respect, in our conversations with Waka Kotahi and the risk around contract rates and everything like that, um, we're encouraged to put our best foot forward in terms of um, our draft submission. Um, and option three, um, the budget's um, uh, increase to reduce all current bridge and pavement service level risks and, along, and address longer term bridge and pavement risks. Um, the advantage of that option is addressing our bridge maintenance backlog over three years, um, accounting for um, all the benefits of um, option two, um, but um, potentially maintaining and increasing some of our level of service for our community. Um, however, at that level of funding, um, it, it is likely to be unsustainable and unlikely to attract um, Waka Kotahi subsidy. Um, so just a couple of last points to note. So the budget composition can be refined prior to final submission on the 8th of December as part of the long term planning process and our submission will um, essentially create a cap on our subsidy. Um, so council must still be willing to match what we um, submit for. So and Waka Kotahi subsidizes 51% um, of all of our approved road expenditure and the specific financial impact of the draft program will be established before our final submission. But it's really important to note that this will be done and understood alongside our financial strategy that we're working really closely with Susan on. Um, so I hand back to the question. QB. Right, Tim, questions? So I just want to make sure I've got this right in my mind, QP, because we're saying here with number two, uh, option two, you know, two to three percent rates rise. Yeah. Ah, but what we're doing is we're going to Waka Kotahi with our best foot forward saying, will you match this level of investment if we do that? They say yeah. yes. It will then come to us in the LTP where we look at it and alongside everything else and go yes or no. So councillors don't need to be afraid today that they're committing to that in the LTP. That's the stage to come, but we need to put our best foot forward today. Yep. It's, it's, it's a, you, you are committing to putting your best foot forward yes. in terms of applying for this much budget to allow us to address um, these problems ahead of us. Um, and Walker Kotaki may come to the table and match, completely match um, our submission. Correct. And in that case, um, it will enable us to address what we need to address um, over the next three year term. Um, with, with that, yes. But when it comes to the LTP, yeah. we could, if we desired, go, well, actually, we're going to pull back. Of course, Walker Kotaki will pull, pull back the same now. So we're throwing away money, but that's for that conversation that day. Yeah. And just because we don't do the work that we're oh absolutely I just wanted to make it clear to do this correct we're not making it too we will, um, I, I, I'm not going to use the term challenge but we will if, if there is going to be a reduction we'll make sure that you understand all the risks yeah. as, as a result yeah. of that and what parts yeah. of the program will get pulled back if the funding does get pulled back yeah. and the same to say if Waka Kotaki don't come to the party we'll have to prioritize such um, yeah. that thank, thank you, you. New first in time. Yes, to me, it's a little bit of a cart full of horses that we're, we're, we're going to ask for some money for a budget that the council hasn't even considered yet. Um, probably not, not just a way of working on it, I think it's another way of doing it. Um, and I, I know it's caused us grief in the past. I can't help but think that if you put your best foot forward, and because we've got a lot of work to still do and some conversations ahead, um, in the ideal world, why wouldn't you be pushing your options through? Um, I think option two is enables us to address what we can realistically achieve in that time frame as well. Um, and <laughs> that, that, that came in, but um, that's been right. Well, we did, we did, we did, we did, I'm sure we could always do more, but yeah. I do want to carry it with the fact of um, it is significant from a cost perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and whilst we may be able to um, increase the level of service on some things, um, it's, yeah, it, it is what do you think? cost mm -hmm. okay. Inspirational. Mm -hmm. um, the 51% financial assistance rate has been recently reviewed in conjunction with the same. I just wondered if we hope and anticipate that that might move and if they gave any um, feedback on why it's remained the same, will they just say it is what it is? Yeah, I didn't go down. So 51% is the minimum. Um, so there are a range of parameters that are used for assessing it. So, um, I'm just going to quickly read my 
thought this would come as a question, and, and um, <laughs> so it's central line kilometres, so linked to the road network, capital value uh, of properties, an asset base, inverse of rating units, um, which identifies local authorities that have the smallest number of rate payers from which to source their local share, index of deprivation, um, <laughs> and total cost of all activities for a recent period. Um, so it's and then there's a diagram and standard deviation and reading and things. It's a very complicated tool um, that they go to, but we get advice of what our bar is, um, as opposed to being part of the process. We don't control or influence any of those things. Then. No. Does, does that sort of reflection of being second best writing? Other other councils will be able to go second with the other one that's better than us. Um, I would take it from the fact that um, since we have been operating a very efficient voting network, we need to address um, some um, backlog of maintenance and different things like that. I think it's our turn yeah. um, that we get some funding, and I think getting 100% of what we ask for and well, getting 51% of 100% of what we ask for is a very good outcome um, in terms of addressing that. So um, if you are talking to anyone, I'd be at Walker Kotahi, I'd be encouraging them that we're putting up this stuff to look with the needs that we have. You don't mind. On the regional transport meetings that we're looking at, there's probably a bit of a gap in North Island police work because they can't get it started and over the line, and some of that funding is sitting there ready to chug along. And, and that's true, while well, some of you may have felt we miss out putting our best foot forward before. It's probably put us a pretty good light now to go to them and they're oh, well aware of our issues and we're just a couple of years probably we really struggle with that. Yeah. And we've been doing a lot of work to communicate um, this bridge issue with Waka Kentucky directly and having those conversations around the fact that we are at a time of need in terms of time of interest and community. Yeah. So they are well aware of that. They are. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Yeah, I mean, have a local level of support of it as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a top dog for and we're going to have any other questions. No, so listen here. Right, we have a recommendation that is BNC. Might someone like to move? Yep. Tracy will move. Yeah. 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 All those in favour? Those against, Gary, thank you very much. Stu, we could have been out late for lunch. Do you want to push along with all these chats at the end of the day? Was everyone happy with that? Yeah. All right, so we'll run the them through. Um, road and procurement policy 23.8.8. Same goes again. Good morning, thank you much. Thanks, Stu. Um, so, procurement strategy. Um, a review and an update uh, on our transportation procurement strategy is a three-year requirement mandated by Walker Kadadi, um, and also that as you know, so we can receive that subsidised funding that we talked about. Um, there's not dramatic changes um, in the strategy um, from the last review in 2020, uh, but it does build on it, um, and that's in the addition of some broader outcome strategies that um, I mean, we, we need to see in our procurement but also the block of the we wanting, wanting to see and it's around um, environmental sustainability in our procurement, um, diversity um, and some potential upskilling of small subcontractors that are in the industry and in the supply at the moment. Um, the contract style for our um, for our rating contract currently is net cost reimbursement. Um, <laughs> we are proposing that will remain unchanged, and that's fully supported by Walker Kutahi. They think it's a good model um, and be faithful to um, you know, where our network is. So, um, as far as cost per rating on we go, so they're pretty happy with that. They don't want to see us change that. Um, the current road and maintenance contract is due to expire um, under the current agreement in December of this year. So, um, to allow suitable tender period and potential mobilisation for a possible new supplier, if that's the outcome of the tender process, um, while Qatar have approved in principle um, an extension of the current contract to 30th of June 2024. And then the, the other advantage of that as well, which sort of aligns us um, you know, in, our, in our financing years as well, which makes, um, makes things a little bit easier than a financial perspective. Um, 
we were happy with the, cup, uh, the current delivery from Fulton Hagen and, and the um, and the writing space. They are uh, they're delivering a good service. Um, we've got a strong relationship. It's a very collaborative relationship. And um, and six months old in the role, I think this. Um, you know, there has been some really good stewardship from from the end contractor and um, our employees advising us and supporting us and making some pretty good decisions about work from the network. So happy there. So um any questions or around that at all? Um this is I guess the semantics thing, but just on page 111, which is page 11 of your report. We talk about our 30 year vision being we deliver the infrastructure services that support our community. I just wanted to potentially take out the will. Otherwise, it's always something that we're going to do instead of something yeah, that we're doing. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a good job yeah. being done. Um, and then I saw there was a bit of talk in there about potential collaboration or partnership with councils across boundaries and the reasons why that doesn't work at the moment. But then there was also comments in there about ongoing um, struggles to fill roles and attract suppliers. And I just wanted to check that that will continue to be an open door or something that's investigated. Yeah. I understand yeah. actually, I think um, that's going to be really important around the bridge piece mm -hmm. um, in, in that instance. And, um, as a council, we're working um, closely with our partner Waitaki on some things and then continuing to explore um, what opportunities there are. Um, in terms of physical road maintenance, it's a bit more challenging because we have quite different networks um, and it's quite strange to that network around what we do. Um, but in terms of the broader special skills, I think there's, um, yeah, the different opportunities. jobs as opposed to people on yeah. jobs. That'd be cool. Thank you. you. Just, oh, sorry, you just mentioned something um, about scaling the smaller contractors. Is that going to be a responsibility of council? Um, during the delivery of the contracts around, I mean, the end of council is, um, you know, as a client, we can put some conditions into our contract. Say, um, for instance, there needs to be a minimum, um, well, say, 15% subcontract involvement. Um, and the revenue spend per year. Yeah. Um, some carry around the, oh, it needs to be meaningful or even one thing. I mean, that will um, enable some of those small contractors to put to, 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 to all of it. Yeah. No, that, no, that's clear. Yeah. And so that's um, Pop and Hogan using, um, in, in the instance of the current contract, um, they may engage a local contractor in the Mania Toto to undertake some work um, mm -hmm. around trees and different things like that where they have the skills and then they can support um, that contractor. Yeah. In. In that space and upskill you to the point where they might okay. become a bigger contractor and a bigger player. Understood. Thank you. Anyone else? Nothing to supply. Yeah. Just one, sorry, um, 7.3 performance measurement and monitoring. Um, broadly, the success of transportation service delivery can be measured by, and there's five things in there. And I just wondered if one of those should include quality of the product. Um, um, sorry, it's page 51 of your report, 151 of the agenda. And uh, 7.3. So I think I think that will potentially come out of cheaper in program, um, like in terms of finalizing it as an additional um, line item there. It's, yeah, we'll make that amendment. I think that's good. Yeah. Any more questions from staff? I don't know. The recognition recommendation A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Any questions? Yeah, I'm liking. Move up. Time move. Second. None. Um, All favour? Aye. Okay. Yes. Next one. Last one, guys, for lunch. And it is Facebook Learning Project 23.8.9. All right, cool. Thank you. I'll take this report as being read. So we're going to practice the outside required return services association um, to take part in the places of remembrance project. Um, so that's around the distribution of a copy on street signs that are made um, after um, individuals who have served. Um, so um, this is being proposed to be um, done for the Alexander Library, but we want to bring that to council um, for approval. 
um, so that it could be rolled out should we um, have a request for it to be rolled out in other um, parts of um, the district. Um, and um, yeah, I'll hand back for any questions. Um, any questions while I'm trying to run through, it's just going to deal again. Great idea. Thank I just did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the only comment I want to add to it, it's fallen soldiers, which tend to be men. Um, one of the issues we've got is not fallen, it's who served. It's served, yes. It is. It goes to third after fallen, who's got to serve. Served. Mm -hmm. So that could. Does. Capture a woman. Yeah. Got to get the street named after them first. But yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much to staff. I've been a lot of work. We've had a lot to do with the other day. In the last couple of weeks, even big near the Tracy's Wolf here with the steering and everything. So well well done to you guys. It's been tough on the bridge things. Good to see it's getting a bit of yeah. progress action. Absolutely. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to break for lunch and come at the quarter past one. Slightly different. Only three minutes for the lunch break. Don't you wish you went with Tom and Dad? There you go.